So good morning, everybody. It's nice to be back. Nice after that uh, beautiful dinner we had yesterday. And uh, I have chosen probably the longest talk title that we had on the program. So that's always good. So essentially, you have the whole message in the title already. You can go home, go back to sleep. Or if you listen, we have a couple interesting insights. And what I will talk about is Ibex. And Ibex is something that you will hear about a lot. And you might have seen them yesterday already. And I will talk about how you can enable your project and uh, um, to attract more members, more people that will contribute to the code, more people that will build on top of this code. So essentially what I will talk about is how you get actually the real benefits of open, so of open source, that part of open source that everybody talks about when they say open source, um, which is essentially a community, not just the code itself. And we'll do that talk by following around Carl. And you have seen Carl yesterday, if you were at the dinner, most likely, and around. Um, so Carl is an ibex, so that's a mountain animal. This one is, of course, a cuter version of it. And um, I wanted to bring ibex today. Unfortunately, he's still asleep, so I just got this picture a couple minutes ago. So he's asleep, he's doing well, so don't worry. Um, that's good. Now, as much as I would love to talk about cute animals for the next 20 minutes, um, this is actually Ibex that we will talk about. It's a two-stage pipeline CPU core. And what is it? In the RISC-V world, of course, these days, um, ISO strings are specified as regular expressions. That's how you do a, a core description. So we have a RV32 core. It has an optional I or an E extension. Uh, it has an M, it has a compressed instruction set, so multiplier is optional, and you have the uh, CSR extension, which probably everybody has, but it's kind of now adding to the string. Two-stage pipeline, and those numbers are from a bit of an older release, and I'll get to that in a second. So IPC and uh, area in the area of a ARM M0 core, roughly. So that's what we are targeting, small microcontroller cores. So how come you have never heard of IBEX before? Um, could be because you have heard the, of, of the previous um, project. So IBEX was zero risky before and was done here in, in Zurich uh, by the PULP team. And they did a first open risk based CPU core, Orion, long back in time. And this core changed. This got uh, reimagined as, as risky and then there is a zero risky, which shares a lot of um, the nice features of it. And in end of 2018, we kind of, as low risk, got involved in a code base, since we have a very strong interest in making this core, core and code successful. And we took over, we did some changes, and we'll get into those in a second. And essentially, the idea is to make IBEX the go-to core if you're going for a M0 class design. And as I said, we're doing that based on the great work that has been done here at Pulp. And essentially, we have the commercial um, motivation and the financing to actually make that happen. And if you look at uh, the GitHub history of IBEX, and of course, I always wanted to draw a kind of error like that because that's just totally how you do marketing slides. Um, it's going steep up. It's, kind of, it's, it's amazing. It's, um, beyond graphs, what did we do so far? It's nothing earth shattering, but it's kind of the useful maintenance you want and have to do in order to make this core a success. So we replaced the debug system, which was previously based on a kind of older open risk one, um, with a risk v specific. Uh, specification compliant one. We updated to the latest, latest privilege specification, changed some CSRs, changed how the program counters work. We um, are currently in the work, uh, progress of modifying the trap handlers. We added the RISC-V formal interface, which is just a couple of ports, but still very useful to use. Um, we have a initial UVM-based test bench that is um, based on the work um, that Google is open sourcing through Chip Alliance, the RISC-V DB. We have been fixing a lot of bugs that came up along the way, and we did a lot of code cleanups 
uh, both in style and to make some commercial lint tools happy. Most of those changes were done by other people, and um, I'm very thankful for them um, to actually have done that. So that was the first part that I will be talking about. That's about IBEX, the core, the code, and the uh, work we have been doing on that. So IBEX is open source. Of course it is. It lives in the lowest GitHub repository. And this looks awfully stretched. OK. But this is open source as well. You have your, oh, thanks for your patch. Um, we will have a look at it sometime, and we'll get back to you. This is a reality in many EDA projects that you see out there. It's open source because you can download it, but there is no real way of actually contributing back to it. And that's the problem that we will have a look at now. And that's what I call the mountain of open participation. And of course, this is the Toblerone mountain uh, from a famous mountain here in Switzerland. And if an engineer would do a draw, uh, engineer would do a drawing like that, it of course looks more simplistic. That matches my artistic skills. Open source is the base what you need if you um, want to attract new people. That's, that's what everybody tells you. That's, that's how you um, make sure that you create code, that you create a project that can be used, can be modified. But you want more. You want actually to enable everyone to contribute back because you want those changes. You want to access to the community. That's what I will talk, um, call open participation. What do you get by doing that? You get new contributors, both in code, documentation, bug reports, tests, ports to different FPGAs or ASIC technologies, maybe. You attract new users. Um, and I think that shouldn't be underestimated. If you just have a code blob that is out there, how do you judge is it good or bad? It might have UVM tests, it might have a lot of other things, but if you see that there's an active community around that, that gives you a very strong indication this might be something that is actually worth looking at. So you want those users. And of course, in the end, it helps your business. If you are able to make it easy for new people that come in to use that code or get started on developing it, it also makes it easy for your new hires and the new people that join your company. Or if you have a team that is distributed across the world, it makes it easy for them to work on that as well together. So how do we reach that? And I think the simple, simplistic answer would be if you have the internal developer being equal to an outside contributor, then you have reached the peak of open participation. This, of course, is one line, and one line never cuts it. So let's have a look at some some topics in, in more detail, and I'll go into those in a second. So we want to have open source here. So we need to have the code, we need to have all tests, we need to have all scripts. That's essentially stuff that copyleft licenses would say, this is everything you need to actually reproduce this, um, this build artifact, this output. You need to have clear licensing, and I'll get to that in a second. You need to have documentation, not only design documentation, you also need to have process documentation. How do you actually make a patch? How would you make a release? Things like that. You need to have access to tools, and this is a topic that we'll get into in a second, both in terms of, access, well, let's, let's say, getting access to the tools at all, and um, also be able to get access to similar versions or similar types of tools, at least, to make sure that you actually can reproduce what has been done before. You need test and build infrastructure, and you not only need that, you also need to make sure that people have access to it, and you need to have communication channels that are open. You need to have a way for people to actually join the effort on a mailing list, on a chat, whatever you prefer, but it needs to be transparent and open. It's not helped if you have a decision that has been made behind closed doors and you just throw over the patch over the wall, then you have not really reached this um, open participation goal. If you have added all that and probably a couple other things that I forgot about, then we are there. Now, that's all good. And we started this talk with IBEX, and that's what I will use as an example of how low risk tries to get there. It's not saying that we are there. It's kind of essentially presenting the, the way we are, um, the path that we are on. So first thing we had is we need all code, we need all tests, and we need all scripts there. 
And the answer that you need to be able to answer is, can everybody reproduce what I did? Can I get something useful out of this uh, code dump? And the other thing is, can I make sure that if I change something, the stuff still works? If you don't have the tests available, then you can't really make that sure. How are we doing on IBEX? The full system Verilog RTL is there. The build descriptions are there. The UVM test benches are there at the moment. So at least the initial one, meaning we don't have that much up our sleeves. We don't have at the moment a very kind of minimal self-contained test SOC that you can use and get started on. So this would be something very, very useful for people to join the project to get started because just having a core requires more. And there is no test that doesn't require UVM. And I'll get back to that in a second why I think this is a critical thing to have. The second topic was licensing. I said we want to have a license that is clear so that everybody that joins the project knows what is going on. And if you have a contributor's license agreement, you should think about whom you do that with. Do you want to give a perceived evil company the full rights to your code? Do you want to give it to a non-for-profit? Who do you kind of have your CLA with? Um, in IBEX, we have chosen Apache license for reasons that essentially are um, risk management. Every company has a essential preferred license. Um, for us, it was that one. Um, we have a CLA. It's done for legal clarity and to make this choice more future-proof. The open source hardware world is a evolving and pretty new field. And there is this feeling with many people that there might be risks or license changes needed future down the road. Um, that's what a CLA is for. And we try to make it as easy to apply as possible. So essentially, you have this uh, signed off by line uh, that is well known from the Linux kernel community. You add that to your pull request, and essentially, that's how you apply the CLA. That simplifies the application process. Of course, doesn't simplify the CLA itself. You should, still should read it at least once. Um, Alex gave a talk about that yesterday. It has been recorded. Um, so that's the full story on that. Why do we want to have a simple license and why do we want to have it applied as easy as possible? And if we have a CLA, why do we want to make it as easy as possible to actually apply that CLA? This is a picture of a pull request I did to the RISC-V ISA specification. And um, if you don't see the change, it's right there. So it had this major contribution to the um, specification. And the thing is, you want those things. You want those drive-by commits of people that just say, I'm doing this tiny little thing. So you want to have a process to make it as easy as possible to actually contribute to a project. And this, of course, is the ridiculous small one. What else do we need? Um, tools, and we have had a huge track yesterday on tools, and there will be more discussion, and there is always more discussion about how do you get access to commercial EDA tools? Commercial EDA tools are around. They're what we're building on top, and they're a very, very useful and essential thing to have. But it's hard to get access to them. Have you ever seen a Cadence webshop <clears throat> where you can buy a license or a, a Synopsys webshop? It's not there. And even if you have now access, actually obeying the license restriction is a pretty tricky thing to do. And we have seen a kind of Tim and a giving a talk yesterday of this ridiculous dance you sometimes have to do in order to just kind of make sure that you obey those license restrictions. One of them is, for example, that you have to stay within a certain geographic area where this tool is located or where your headquarters is located. That's all fine if you have a traditional company that has kind of one central point. But how do you kind of even define the center of this community that builds around this piece of open source IP? And how do you define a 50-mile radius around that? It's just, you can't do it. Um, so, and, well, the thing is then, of course, free, well, not of course, but unfortunately, those tools that we have in the open source area are not yet up for a job. So um, we need to find a, a middle way there. What did we do with IBEX? We try to make it um, compile and work on as many tools that are at least accessible to the small hobbyist community and, of course, scaling up. And um, so it's all compatible with Verilator. That's, I think, the one tool that has the best system Verilog support out there in the open source world today. 
They're compatible with Vivado and Vivado Webpack. That's at least a free-to-use version. And um, we also know that our stuff works on essentially all the commercial simulators and synthesis tools that we have tried. So you have a kind of clear path forward for industry use cases. Um, what I said with UVM before, if you have UVM tests, you require a commercial simulator license. There is no open source simulator that can do UVM tests. So and this is a major point because essentially prevents all your open source contributors to actually run the tests that you have. So we need to find a way to make that better. And I have a CocoDB talk coming up, so that's Python-based verification that in the afternoon. So that is one of the solutions that you could go with. Um, the other one is kind of to find a way to actually give us open source simulators that support UVM. Um, let's see. UVM is not particularly small in terms of scope that you need to support in a tool. <coughs> Sorry. So if you don't have the ability to actually buy the tool or download it somewhere, it would be at least nice if you can kind of commit a patch and get that tested. And the typical way of doing that is continuous integration. You do run the builds, you run the tests. It has been the standard way of doing open source contribution and ensuring their quality in the software domain for, for many, many years now. Hardware has additional challenges that the tests typically take much longer, but that's not a kind of challenge that prevents everything. The challenge that prevents a lot of things is currently access to commercial tools, because are you able to actually make the build outputs of those tools available to random people on the internet? Do you allow them to upload random code in a pull request that goes through tools that typically does violate your license agreements? So just having that license available is not the solution, not, not the full solution at least. So what do we do with um, Ibex? We have GitHub CI. Um, I wanted to get it committed by, essentially before I came here, Life got in the way. Um, so it will be very soon that we have at least very late the best tests. So that's a very good starting point to make sure that a commit at least doesn't break something extremely badly. Um, there is no solution yet for commercial tools. And we are talking to many vendors. We're talking to other people. What can we do to actually enable contributors to at least run the tests? Next topic is documentation. So we want design documentation and we want process documentation. Process documentation is essentially that what you see in many, many pro uh, projects already there. You have a contributing.md, for example. How do you contribute a change? Um, how do you make a release? How do you make the development environment on your individual PC happen? And that's also something, especially the last point, is, is again pretty critical. If you go to a commercial company that have central managed IT, they deploy your or ideally, they deploy your uh, PC for you. You get all the tools installed. You have your module environment or whatever you have, and you're all set. If you have now random people on the internet coming in, you don't have a central IT department that now deploys their PCs. So you need to do much more scripting and documentation to actually get them up and running. What do we do with IBEX? We have design documentation at read the docs, so it's there. We need more process documentation that's coming up soon. Mostly since we're still figuring out the processes. On the communication, you want to have, as I said, kind of open communication channels, mailing lists, chat, issue trackers. You also want to make sure that your expectations and your roadmap are kind of communicated and visible to the world, because otherwise you are in back in this position that you just get stuff thrown over the wall that has been decided in internal company meetings, and you actually have no idea for other people to weigh in and kind of yeah, be there in those discussions. On IBEX, I think all the short-term stuff is there. There is no long-term roadmap that we are able to kind of clearly communicate at the moment, so expect more of that coming up soon. The short-term roadmap is essentially codified in, in GitHub issues. Just look for that. So to recap, to come to an end, is open source is just the beginning. The source is the, the base, but it's not the final goal. Um, that's what open, I termed open participation, and that unlocks the real benefits if you tell somebody, we're going open source, that's what you want to go for. Commercial tools and commercial licenses are a major challenge at the moment. It's not about just the cost, it's also about accessibility and kind of obeying those license restrictions. And the thing is, it's not something that only low risk uh, can do, so everybody can 
actually join there. And give it a try with the smaller projects. That's what we did with IBEX. That's why we started with a kind of a small CPU core to try all that out. And if you kind of feel uncomfortable somewhere, low risk is available for hire. So just talk to us. Final picture. Go for open participation because open source is better together with it. Um, we're hiring and Carl is waiting for you in, at GitHub. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. We have quick questions. We're running a little bit over time. Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, so my, my um, albeit limited experience in industry of how sort of small CPU cores or even big ones get developed is that there's lots and lots of activity and they tend towards an extremely stable design that is taped out. That basically is a hard stop on that code base. And then if they do an iterative improvement, it gets forked and the whole process kind of starts again. And that's very different to things like open source software where there's lots of continual sort of churn on the code base where there's lots of small incremental improvements. Um, and open source hardware, particularly open source cores like the one you just described, kind of feel like they sit in a middle ground. I don't know if you have any comment on how you manage that sort of thing where you've potentially got people who are contributing to the code base, which is really good and important, but they've got no intention of taping it out. So, yeah. So essentially the answer here is once you want to tape out a, any design that contains, in this case, the CPU core, you definitely will kind of essentially fork off the road a bit. So you will take whatever is there at this particular moment and you will harden it, you will verify it, kind of put it through more tests. And the hope is that the stuff that is discovered during that process is fed back immediately into the kind of the, the master branch, but you're not going to kind of always pick the latest changes. And this is not something that is uncommon in software either. So whenever you build a software product, you're also going to just pick essentially one point in the road that you just see and build your changes on top of that and make sure. And that's, I think, the, the main lesson that we have learned in open source software is you should make sure that you kind of go back to the main road as soon as you can, because otherwise you kind of have this diverging trees of random crap piled on top of each other in, in the bad sense. Um, so yeah. So we, and that's what we're trying to do, is make it as easy as possible to actually return to that main road. Do you have a question? I have a question, yeah. Sorry to turn it in the panel, but uh, you seem to be implying as if commercial and open source were two separate things, whereas it's Not. actually proprietary versus open source, right? Yes. Because open source can be commercial too. Uh, so some of the slides just said, you know, open source this and commercial that. I, I'd kind of definitely try to work on the way we as FOSSI kind of uh, talk about this. Yeah, fully agree. So open source is commercial. It's, that's, that's what I earn my living with. My next talk will be about that. About that. But my yeah. next talk meaning at the next event. Today I'm going to talk about something else. So let's thank for the beginning. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>